Welcome, I'm Jackie Bruley, and it is my absolute pleasure to welcome you to this month's Ask the Expert, the History of the Salem Witch Trials. Now, before we get started, I want to explain how this afternoon's event will work. So we're using Zoom webinar, as you can tell, um, and as our audience, we can't see or hear you, but we definitely want to hear from you. Um, you can ask your questions during the course of the conversation anytime by opening up the Q&A tab at the bottom of your screen and typing in your questions. Um, just put them in at any point during the conversation today. We'll do our best to address as many as we possibly can, but there's a lot of you, so we're, gonna, we're just going to try. Um, and if you see a question you really want to hear the answer to, vote for that by clicking on the thumbs up icon in the Q&A tab. The most popular questions will then rise to the top of the list so that we can ask them. Um, to animate, sorry, to activate Zoom's automated captioning feature, select the closed captioning button at the bottom of your screen. Then you're going to click on live transcript and two transcription display options are going to pop up. We recommend that you can select subtitle to enable captioning at the bottom of your screen, but you can also choose full transcript, which will open up a sidebar window where you can see what every speaker is saying. Please bear in mind that closed captioning might be slightly delayed, but it should be there. So now we have done the housekeeping. I'm excited to introduce our expert for this afternoon, Dr. Emerson Baker. Dr. Emerson Baker is a professor of history at Salem State University. He is the author or co-author of six books on the history and archeology span of early New England, including A Storm of Witchcraft, The Salem Trials and the American Experience, and The Devil of Great Island, Witchcraft and Conflict in Early New England. He has served as an advisor for PBS television's American Experience and Colonial House, and he has done extensive work on witchcraft in colonial America, as well as doing work with numerous archeological sites along the East Coast of the United States. And now it is my pleasure to introduce Dr. Emerson Baker. Hi, Jackie. Hi, to be Emerson. Here. Great to have <laughs> you. So I'm seeing that we're starting to get some questions in already. Um, but just to kick things off and give people some ideas, I'm going to ask one first because I'm here and right. I get to. <laughs> so right. go for it. Here's my question for you. There are all these like sort of famous and well-known and they're not really characters because they're people that anyone who knows about Salem kind of knows about. Do you have someone that you find really fascinating that you think about more often than the others? Well, I have lots of favorites, I guess. Um, <laughs> I'm, I'm, I'm very interested in John Proctor, for mm. one, um, in part because of how he's sort of misportrayed in various ways through, uh, through the Crucible. Um, and I've done a fair amount of research on him to try to find out his, his real story. So I, I find I find him interesting. I find Giles Corey to be fascinating. Um, it's hard. It's, it's honest to God, it's, it's hard to choose because we could sit here and talk about an hour, the whole hour, just about probably any one of these people. But I think I find um, Proctor really the first time I saw John Proctor's will, uh, it, my, my spine started tingling because at the top he was writing from prison, basically knowing that he is going to die soon. Uh, he hasn't had his trial yet, but he knows it's not going to go well because everyone who's gone to trial ends up being executed. And at the top of, of his will, in bold letters, he says, in the name of God, amen. And um, just just so people would know, so posterity would know that he considered himself to be a devout Christian uh, and was nothing like a witch. And, you know, I mean, we could talk, we could tell anecdotes about about most of the victims like that, where um, the, the, they were really um, railroaded, maybe for lack of a better term, right? Um, but Proctor to me seems particularly interesting. And I guess I'm fond of him because, uh, of course, I was on the team that confirmed the uh, the execution site, which is actually on a part of Gallows Hill known as Proctor's Ledge and was land that was actually owned by his, his family uh, after his death. So, wow. um, yeah. Fascinating. So, anyhow, I, I, I could go on, Jackie. We talk about them all, but... <laughs> Sure, of course. Um, okay, so we're getting lots of audience questions. I'm going to take you to the first one. This is from John Minahan. I hope I'm pronouncing that right, John, who asks, is it true that children were tortured into giving false testimony on their parents? Um, yeah, but only teenagers. No, no, seriously, um, we know that um, a little gallows humor, I guess. I mean, I got to admit, some of you, you have to try to make the best of this because it is a really, it's a grim, depressing subject yeah. and one that kind of reverberates, I think, right? But we do know, um, technically, there are only two ways to con in normally to convict someone from witchcraft. One was sworn testimony by two eyewitnesses who had seen someone convict an act, carry out an act of black magic. Now, Jackie, hopefully you and I can agree that 
that pacts with Satan to use his evil powers are not real then or now? Pretty hard to get people yeah. to, to, to swear an oath to that effect, right? The other, ironically, is for someone to confess to being a witch. And now you're thinking like, why would I confess to being a witch knowing that it's the death penalty, right? Well, honestly, the answer is, I'm putting it in quotes here, judicial torture. What we might consider to be mild, of course, mild in the eye of the, of the victim, I guess, is another question. Torture was, we do know, was used at least on some uh, people in 1692. And in particular, yes, John Proctor wrote that his son and a couple of the other boys, teenage boys, were, 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 being, uh, were being tortured. And particularly what he describes is um, that you, you tie them neck and heels. That is, you know, you tie your, your neck to your heels, truss you up, and then you grab, grab, you, grab you by your, your uh, belt or belt loop uh, of your pants and hold you upside down like that till blood gushes out your nose. Now, that probably would never have killed you, right? But I think it's maybe kind of like the 17th century equivalent of waterboarding. If you think about yeah. it, um, you know, when you're being waterboarding, you don't think you're going to, you, you, you're not going to die, but it's hard. It's hard to convince yourself of that while it's happening. Right. And once you go through something like that, all of a sudden you'd be much more willing to rethink the fact that you're not a witch, because particularly at that point, you're, you're thinking moment to moment. And in fact, we know that John Proctor wrote uh, a letter of complaint about this to three ministers saying that, that this was happening. Um, how widespread it was, we, we don't know. Uh, but that's, it certainly did happen and, again, was within the bounds of, of judicial limits that you could actually do this. So, yeah, that did happen. Yikes. Well, there's your answer, John. Yeah. Um, yeah. All right. Here's our next question. Um, Emerson, as you predicted, did moldy rye really play a role in the hysteria? <laughs> Jackie, I told you, this is, this is like the most popular question. Um, yeah. Right. So short answer is no. Um, I actually, I, I long, much longer answer. I, I, I do call my book a storm of witchcraft because I equate it to that other great Essex County tragedy, right? The perfect storm, which, mm. which took out the, the fishing fleet in a horrible, horrible hurricane. Um, it, that is to say, there are lots of different factors that to play as to what, what would cause the largest outbreak in, of witchcraft in American history. And also no single explanation. Right? So it's not, you know, it's not like that magic bullet, right? Uh, so. Um, I think there were there were lots of reasons why people became afflicted, uh, even why they confessed. Um, I think way down on that list is the possibility of th some of them ingesting uh, some some bad bread. But th here's here's the way that the theory goes, and it was first put forward about uh, 1970, um, which may give you an idea that this the idea of having um, ergot poisoning and having bad LSD is kind of out of the the 1960s and 70s Timothy Leary kind of drug cult, but Here's, here's the, the, the rationale behind it. Um, the idea is that if people in the 17th century, uh, they ate their bread mostly out of, made out of rye that they would harvest locally. And if you have a supply of rye that gets wet and damp, a natural fungus known as ergot can start growing on it. And um, then if you make your bread with the ergot into it, um, you, you're ingesting this poison. Um, and the idea is like, okay, so the afflicted girls all ate the same had it's the same source of bread and they all were having essentially bad trips and this explains what was going on in 1692. Um, there's there's uh, now I'm, I'm not a physician nor do I play one on television but <laughs> in this case I've studied this enough to know to tell you that ergot is a funny thing there's several different types of ergot poisoning only one of them has these hallucinogenic side effects and that one in particular has some really other really nasty uh, manifestations as well too particularly essentially causes gangrene uh, oh. on all of your limbs so what happens is your limbs shrivel blacken fall off and you die having some hallucinations apparently before you die so again like no one describes anything like this in 1692 and i think they would have because it would have been really obvious and actually as far as we know most of the afflicted girls seem to have lived long lives um, we do know only only maybe one or two that died within a few years of the uh, of the trial. So it doesn't make any sense from a medical point of view. But also, too, if you consider that in 1692, this was a colony wide problem. There were afflicted girls, afflicted people in Andover. There were afflicted people in Salem. There were afflicted people in Boston. So we're not talking about one common source of grain to make their bread. 
And also, too, why is it that people would, uh, uh, why would only be one or two members of a family who might become afflicted if everyone's eating the same food, right? Um, and also, too, if, you ha if you're ingesting poison on a regular basis, your condition continually goes downhill. But we know from the descriptions of the court cases that um, when the afflicted girls would, would be behaving uh, fairly normally, it seemed to be okay, and then one of the accused witches went into the courtroom and all of a sudden they would have their fits, you know. Uh, right. So again, yeah. it seems to be a little bit more on cue, uh, nothing like as, a, as sort of what we might think of as a disease process or someone being, being poisoned. So again, it sounds good. Can I completely rule out that someone didn't have something like that, maybe one or two folks? Sure, it's possible. I think other things though, like mass conversion disorder and PTSD probably help for more of the problems. And again, there is no, no one answer. So there you go. How's that? Perfect. I love it. Also great. And a thing about the uh, gangrene, I had no idea about that. So that's a horrifying fun fact for everyone for your Friday. <laughs> 17th century, you know, was, was frankly, was not kinder, gentler times, right? I mean, there was right. some medicine as we know it, but we're also talking about medical practice that involved things like bloodletting and leeches. So yeah. Yeah, a little different. <laughs> okay, next question. Um, this is from Stephen Clayman, who asks, how does the Salem experience fit in the European experience at that time with witchcraft? Excellent question. So, you know, one reason I started studying this was after having taught at Salem for like 20 years, I said, why Salem the witch city? Um, it's the worst outbreak in American history by far with 19 people killed, one pressed to death, five more dying in prison, and all told over 150 people accused. And I don't mean to diminish that loss of life because, uh, it, in, in fact, one of, the, one of those people who died in prison, Roger Toothaker, was an ancestor of mine. But by European standards, unfortunately, this doesn't even qualify as a medium-sized outbreak. During the great age of witch hunts in Europe between roughly 1450 and around the American Revolution, um, roughly 100,000 people were accused of witchcraft in witch hunts throughout the continent. Um, and we think about half of them may have been executed. Uh, wow. The largest outbreak occurred over like a decade in Cologne, Germany, where over 2000 people died. So many that we don't even know all their names, right? And so here's the thing, Jackie, have, have you ever heard of the Cologne witch trials? Probably not, right? No, no, definitely not. I mean, I've been to Cologne. It's an amazing city. What a wonderful people, great cathedral. No one talks about witchcraft. They don't have witchcraft or haunted tours. What is it, you know, so so this is the thing. Salem is just a small piece of the whole witchcraft pie. We even know in New England, there were over 100 people accused of witchcraft before Salem. So, mm -hmm. um, and, then, and, and Salem is not the last either because witchcraft accusations and deaths in, occur, uh, occur in Europe really throughout the 18th century. In, in, in Hungary in the 18th century, I think uh, close to a thousand people are, are put to death for witchcraft. So that kind of leaves us with the question of, you know, why is, Salem, why is Salem the witch city? And to me, again, that's a long, complicated answer. Um, a short answer there is read the book, but a little bit of an insight into that is, I think to some degrees is that if you look at a place like Salem, which, is, which was the first settlement of the Massachusetts Bay Colony, sorry, all you folks in Boston, Salem was actually settled there first. <laughs> um, and when John, when John Winthrop arrives and gives his very famous sermon, City Upon a Hill, he's probably giving that in Salem. Um, if he, in fact, gave it at all, it's, it's another, another interesting question. But the bottom line is, City, City Upon the Hill talks about this, this perfect society that Puritans are going to create, right? And we're, we're leaving England and its corruption in the church and in society to create this perfect utopian Christian commune where we were able to walk hand in hand in peace with each other, with our neighbors, with the Native Americans, and it's going to be a utopian place. And to think that in, in, in the time of people who knew Winthrop, you still ha you have the witch trials where you have literally granddaughters accusing mothers and grandmothers of witchcraft, neighbor accusing neighbor. Um, you see how far they have strayed from the ideal that I think basically no one was ever willing to let, including the residents of Salem to this day, forget what had happened or how great the fall had been from this once utopian ideal. So it's all, I guess it's all part of the pattern and, and Jackie, let's say a little bit more is that frankly, witchcraft is a universal. Uh, if you really think about it, almost every culture throughout history has had some kind of witchcraft because frankly, one person's relig religion is another person's magic is someone else's witchcraft, right? And, and as long as we feel that way and have things like scapegoating and hatred, 
unfortunately, we're going to have some kind of witch hunt. Again, I don't, I, I, this, this, it's, it's not the most uplifting stuff, is it? I'm sorry. So we'll see if we can do better with the next question. <laughs> no, but hey, <laughs> there, there it is. All right, so we actually, here's our next one. It's from Barbara CP who asks, I seem to recall reading that there were some economic incentives for convicting some of the witches, i.e. some families had more property that they lost in the process. Is that true? And if so, did it affect all or some of the accused? So really complicated question, but a good one, and one that's raised a lot. Um, normally, felons in Massachusetts did not have their um, their goods, that is, their not their real estate, but clothes, furniture, livestock seized. But in 1692, Massachusetts is in a legal limbo where Governor Phipps has arrived with a new charter, and the charter basically demands that they create a whole new set of laws for Massachusetts Bay that are not, um, as they describe, not repugnant to the laws of England. So technically in 1692, Massachusetts was kind of operating under English common law rather than its colonial law. And by English common law, people who were arrested for felony uh, could have their goods seized. So there is a, a, a kernel of truth there. And in fact, Sheriff Corwin, who was the sheriff in the Salem witch trials and also judge of uh, uh, Judge Corwin's nephew. So there's a little nepotism going on there. Oh yeah, um, a little bit. <laughs> well, you know, again, some things really don't change if you think about it. But um, honestly, um, Corwin seized a lot of things, but in theory, uh, he, he, couldn't, he couldn't seize one thing. In, in, he could not seize real estate. Hmm. Even if someone was convicted of a felony like witchcraft, their home, uh, their, their property would pass unimpeded to their ears. Um, now, having said that, uh, who did get the goods? Uh, was there a finder's fee for accusing someone of witchcraft? Sadly, no. Then, as well as now, it's the state who benefits. So literally, it was the crown. If any, When Sheriff Corwin sees things, in theory, any assets he had would have become property of the king and the queen, property of the crown. Um, so there, there, people were not directly accusing uh, their neighbors to get their farms. Having said that, though, I think it's fair to say um, witchcraft was a neighborly crime, and there was a lot of boundary disputes or, for example, Rebecca Nurse got in, into an argument with her neighbors when their pigs broke through their, uh, their fences and, and destroyed her crops, and there was all sorts of shouting. And when a couple of days later, the husband of the neighbor had what we would describe as a stroke, hmm. there's a question of, did Rebecca do this? Point is, there was neighborly conflict. There was jealousy. Um, did, did people dislike their neighbors and maybe accuse them? Uh, one way or another to get back at them. There was definitely some some of that, but uh, sadly, no, you couldn't accuse someone and get their firm. That's probably for the best, I guess, yeah. <laughs> probably a good thing that we can't do that then or now, right? Yeah, yeah. <laughs> Next question comes from um, John Keohane, I think. Sorry, John, I think I got that wrong. Um, why was the whole witch insanity so bad in New England compared to the rest of the colonies? So, good question. There were some accusations of witchcraft in other colonies. There were, oh, maybe about a half dozen people accused in Maryland and Virginia. In fact, actually the last trial for, well, really for uh, the minor crime of bewitchment um, um, rather than witchcraft um, occurred actually in Virginia in the 1720s. Uh, but I think part of it has to do is um, there certainly are strong connections between radical Protestantism and, and basically, or shall I say, even any extreme religious areas uh, of, of, of really um, heightened heightened religious sense, sentiments where witchcraft seems to be particularly popular. So in, amongst the English colonies where it took place, for example, though, was in Massachusetts, a Puritan colony, which of course are really kind of um, ra rad radical Calvinists. Um, another colony where you had a lot of witchcraft trials, where you had a, lo a lot of Puritans, Bermuda. Huh. Uh, so, and if you look, and if you look at in, in, in England, when are the most of the witchcraft accusations? During the English Civil War, which is a time of civil and religious turmoil where Puritans are fighting members of the Church of England uh, who are loyal to the king. And also on the continent of Europe, same deal. Um, if you look at areas that were um, centers of fighting and conflict in the Thirty Years' War and the various religious wars as, as fights between sort of Catholics and Protestants on the continent, those tend to be the same areas where witchcraft accusations took place. So. Those areas where, you know, witchcraft, even though it's a social crime in some ways where you're accusing your neighbor maybe over 
over their pigs or something, right? Ultimately, witchcraft is a religious crime, and it comes down to how people feel about themselves and their relationship to God. And people in Massachusetts in 1692 were very worried about that relation. And again, you see that you see that in other places, you see similar kinds of results with lots of witch trials. Interesting. Okay. Yeah. That's really cool. Okay. So next question is from Anonymous. Um, did any of the witnesses who testified for the accused suffer at bad consequences? I was surprised to see that an ancestor had testified to the good character of one of the accused. That's a cool so, connection. Yeah. So, so good for you that you have an ancestor that did that because just to, to speak to, um, to that first, um, you know, it took a lot of courage to stand up uh, in opposition and say, you know, uh, Rebecca Nurse is not a witch. In particular, there was Rebecca Nurse and, and the Proctors and a few others where neighbors and family members would sign petitions saying, you know what, they're not a witch. And even in some cases with Rebecca, one or two of her political enemies and her husband's political enemies in Salem signed the petition because they're going like, you know, again, hey, maybe there's a lesson we could learn today here, Jackie. I don't like their politics, but they're good people, right? They're not a witch. They're not in league with Satan. We just don't see sure. eye to eye on how the town should be run. Right. <clears throat> like, not my so, friend, not a witch. But the problem is then people would say, right, why would, but why, but gosh, you seem like a sane, rational person. <clears throat> why would you possibly say that she's not a witch? What does that say about you? Could Ooh. you be one too? Right. So, but to the question, were there consequences? So, Directly, usually not. Um, but, and actually, frankly, the book that I'm starting to work on now is really kind of like a sequel, The Storm of Witchcraft. And it'll be a long time coming, folks, but it's really, uh, it's about trauma and loss and, and, and really uh, efforts to heal from like 1692 or 1693 to present. Um, and because it's a long path to recovery for these communities. Um, so think about this. If you're sitting in Salem Village Meeting House and it used to be, it, it, traditionally, the Purins, this is the day of worship, is the most important day of the week. And you're sitting in close communion with all your neighbors. And you're sitting on the other end of the same church pew from a family that helped convict your mother and see to her death. What's it like? How do you feel about those people, you know? And, and you can begin to sort of tease this out where, for example, um, families who've been accused of witchcraft tended to, their children tended to marry family, uh, other families whose children uh, were uh, were families of the accused as well too, and accusers the same way. We know that some people, families of judges, families of accusers, sometimes change their names, change the spelling of their name, right? I mean, we all know the famous example of Judge Haythorn, whose descendant becomes Nathaniel Hawthorne. That's a little different case, but we do know of a number of families. Uh, the Corwins, Judge Corwin's family became the Kerwins, for example, right? The, the nurses in some cases became the nurses. Uh, and, and in general, a lot of people left the community. So it's clear to me that there was a real stigma associated with that. But having said that, were, you know, were people uh, ever arrested for false testimony or things like that? The answer is no. And part of the reason for that is because honestly, people believed witchcraft was real in the 17th century, right? Um, these were not superstitious people who were making the charges. These were God-fearing Christians. Witchcraft is in the Bible. University, Harvard, Harvard, Harvard presidents and popes and kings and ministers, everybody believed in witchcraft. So sadly, I think um, there was no sort of official effort taken to, to punish any of these people for false testimony. But also too, the real question is, Jackie, is how many of them really were, were, were fibbing, shall we say, as opposed to genuinely believing in what they were testifying to as well? It's a, and it's, that's a very, very complicated question. And those kinds of issues are hard, hard to get at the truth of, especially over 300 years in the past. Yeah, hard to see into someone's mind, especially when we're so far in the future. Yeah. <laughs> um, next question is coming from Jay Lowell, who asks, um, oh wow, tuning in from Nashville, Tennessee. Thanks for joining us. Um, what is the relationship between female medical practitioners, such as midwives, and accusations of being witches? Were women with medical healing knowledge deemed especially suspicious? So, Actually, the answer is no. Um, where, um, but again, that's sort of a traditional. Uh, there's a traditional stereotype of the witch as midwife or 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 practicing white magic, being a cunning man or cunning woman, and practicing folk healing. The idea being like that. Frankly, if you start, if you're really good at what you do and start healing people that otherwise might die, again, 
how did you do that? Were you using white magic to do it? Um, just to point out, there are different types. There's white magic, helpful magic, um, help people find lost objects, heal them, um, help, oh, by the way, use a Ouija board or things like that to tell your fortune, white magic, uh, as opposed to black magic where you're in league with Satan to harm people. Um, and we all know this because, well, hopefully most of us, at least of my generation, and I think maybe most people still have watched The Wizard of Oz at some point, yes, where we have yeah. the cues, right? And we have Glenda, the, the, the good witch from the, Glenda, the good witch from the North. And again, Hollywood tells you she's in white as opposed to the wicked witch of the West. She's, you know, she's wearing black. She's practicing black magic, right? But technically all of it was magic that, that uh, because, you know, God answers our prayers, maybe, but, you know, we do not practice witchcraft and God answers that, that, those plea. We're in league with Satan. So even if you're trying to help people, are you using evil powers to do it? But having said that, if you really look at who the people were accused of, of, um, of witchcraft, they, um, very few of them are, are midwives or healers. Um, and and uh, maybe a few more so than Europe than here, but overall there really is that sort of, uh, it's, it's, it's an overblown comparison. And, and frankly, on a PBS show uh, that was on TV about less than two weeks ago, on our first case of witchcraft, actually in Scotland, I was disappointed because I said at the time, I said it was a pretty good show, but they, they, I hated the example they used because the example they used of the victim was a woman who was a midwife. And I said, oh no, now everyone's gonna make the connection between nurses and, and healers and, mid, and midwives and witches. And it, it, it usually doesn't hold up. Uh, but again, some people were, usually the role the midwife plays is in, um, they would do observations of the of, of the, the the patients, and if it was a woman, they would literally have the, the the accused witch stripped, and they would give them a complete body search, looking for anything odd, a witch's mark, um, anything out of the ordinary, uh, and that particularly that a, a, a witch's teat that a, 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 a Satan or his minions might suckle on, for example. Um, and frankly, not get to get too graphic here, but to say. By the time you get to my age, most of us have one or two explainable weird things on our bodies that just don't make a lot of sense. And so it wasn't too tough if they wanted to, it seems, to find something like that. And you would have a panel of maybe a half dozen midwives who in this case were were, were examining the accused in the Salem witch trials looking for, for such odd things. Yeah, so that's kind of the role they played. Huh. Fascinating. <laughs> yeah, we'll stop it right there before it gets X-rated real fast, right? <laughs> Sounds good. Uh, next question up is from um, Maxine Pincott, who asks, <clears throat> why were females targeted as witches and males not so much? Yeah, great question. Um, it's And that's not, this is not just a thing in Salem. In Salem, about 75% of the accused were witches. Actually, there were mm. a few more men. Percent, there was actually oh, 27, 28, 29% of the men, I think, men were the victims were accused were men um but th but if you look at it throughout history again throughout the history of witchcraft almost invariably roughly three quarters 70 to 80 percent somewhere in there of the accused are women and unfortunately and i say this uh as the husband of an amazing wife and two incredible daughters um people didn't feel that way about women in pre-modern society we are talking particularly in massachusetts about a patriarchal male-dominated society and that's true to a greater or lesser degree about most pre-modern societies. Uh, if, and again, if you, if you look to, to, to the Bible and you look at Eve coming out of Adam's rib, uh, women were always considered to be, again, I hate to say it, and, and I'm going to put in quotes, the weaker vessel, right? Yeah. Not to be as smart or as strong as men. And again, complete garbage. We know it now. They should have known it then. Um, but, you know, this idea that Oh, a woman may be more susceptible to Satan's wiles because Satan is the great trickster. And, and, and the other thing to mention too here is, and again, I won't go too far into this, but um, technically by, especially in Europe, in Europe, you don't see this much in, in Puritan witch trials, which may say something, but in Europe, kind of the definition of, of, of how you pledge your allegiance to, to Satan is, 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 is sex with the devil, right? Ah. So it's, witchcraft is really very much of a, of a, of a, of a, of kind of a religious crime, but also it's very sort of a sexual act. And so again, too, it's like, ah, Satan is deluding women and taking advantage, et cetera. So um, yeah, that's one of those things I'd like to think was that 
that uh, if there were witch hunts nowadays, at least the men would be accused equally to to women. But you know, unfortunately, those old stereotypes I think are, are even today sometimes hard to hard to break, right? Yeah, definitely fascinating. Um, well, we're going to come back to the questions. Don't worry, everyone. I see that we have a ton left. Um, but first, um, I'm just going to pass the mic over um, to my colleague, Jamie Reese, who is going to join us to spare a special offer with everybody. Hi there, Jackie. Hi, Emerson. I'm really enjoying this event. And uh, hello to everybody at home. Now, audiences turn to GBH for many reasons whether it's to learn more about the history involved with the Salem witch trials or to receive the latest local and national news. Whatever the show, whatever the topic, whatever you learned from it, your vital support helps create great programs. Now you may have noticed it's pledge time at GBH, and that means we have an extra special offer for today's virtual event guests. Now, if today, if you decide to donate $10 a month as a GBH sustainer or $120 all at once, we will send you a copy of Emerson Baker's book, A Storm of Witchcraft. It's pictured behind me right here. And in addition to the book, we will send you two tickets to attend Ghosts and Legends with Jeff Belanger. And this is an in-person event at GBH Studios scheduled for Monday, October 24th from 7 to 9 p.m. In a storm of witchcraft, Emerson shows how a range of factors in the Bay Colony in the 1690s set the stage for the dramatic events in Salem. He looks at all the key players in the outbreak. So that would be the accused witches, uh, the people they allegedly bewitched, as well as the judges and government officials who prosecuted them, and wrestles with questions about why the Salem tragedy unfolded as it did, and why it has become such an enduring legacy. You'll also get two tickets to attend the in-person event, Ghosts and Legends, with Jeff Belanger on Monday, October 24th from 7 to 9 p.m. Hear untold ghostly tales from another legendary storyteller. Jeff is the host, writer, and producer of the New England Legends series and podcast. He also is the writer and researcher for the show Ghost Adventures. He's coming to GBH to take event guests like you on a multimedia adventure that draws on his research, books, podcasts, and TV shows. Now, even if you come to GBH to see Jeff Belanger in the past, he is sure to bring new tales of the paranormal and unexplained. It's the perfect event, just like this one right before Halloween. So giving is short, simple, and secure, and there are three ways to give today. First, you can visit gbh.org slash support events. That's gbh.org slash support events. Or you can send a text message to 800-204-3811 using keyword GBH to donate. Or you can scan the QR code pictured right behind me here, and a donation form will magically appear on your smartphone or device. There will never be a better time to give than right now. And when you give $10 a month as a GBH sustainer or $120 all at once, we will thank you with not just one, but two great gifts. Again, you will receive Emerson's book, A Storm of Witchcraft, and two tickets to see Ghosts and Legends with Jeff Belanger here at GBH on Monday, October 24th. Please take a few minutes today to make your donation, and we will keep you informed and entertained for as long as you'd like. Moments you spend with GBH are well spent, and your donation today would be money well spent too. You can make a difference by supporting GBH today. And now back to Jackie with part two of today's event with Dr. Emerson Baker. Thanks so much, Jamie. Um, we really appreciate everybody's support. You make us be able to do stuff like this. So this is amazing. Now, 
I, we have a ton of questions, but if you have them that are outstanding, don't forget to put them in the chat because this is your this is your shot. Um, and we're gonna kick things off with our first question back. Um, this is a this is a great question. I think you're gonna like this one. It's from um, Jennifer Isles or Ailes. I hope I got that right. Um, who's writing in from Fitchburg, and her oldest daughter is currently a sophomore at Salem State University. Um, and when um, when her daughter moved out to campus, it gave Jennifer an opportunity to spend time in Salem, and she really got into the whole history thing. Um, found the podcast Unobscured with Aaron Mankey, I think, yep. which you yep, contributed to, and has been just a big fan ever since. Um, so here's her question. What is something about the trials that is still unanswered for you and maybe even like keeps you up at night? You just want to know and you don't know the answer. Um, so first off, shout out to Fitchburg, my hometown, and also to Salem uh -huh. State. So yeah, um, there's to me, there's there are so many unanswered questions. And uh, again, to the point where I'm writing another book, to me, I guess the really big thing to me, part of it is, is, the, is the aftermath and what happened and to try to sort that out. The other question is um, trying to understand the motivation of some of the key players. So for example, I'm particularly interested in William Stoughton, the chief justice of the Salem witch trials. What made him tick? Because here's the thing, you can have juries, these, these are English juries with 12, 12 men on them and they, they can come up with the wrong verdict perhaps, but it takes, it takes the judges and particularly the chief judge, William Stoughton, to sign the death warrant. So one thing I've really kind of wondered is, is what made Stoughton tick? And the good news is uh, a friend of mine, Margot Burns, who's written extensively on the witch trials as well, is working on a biography of Stoughton. So I'm hoping, I don't know, Margot, maybe within a couple of years, we'll have the answer to that one. But I think the thing is about, the, here's the bottom line. Salem witch trials, they're, no one will ever write the perfect book on the Salem witch trials because we'll never have all the answers. And frankly, we're always seeing things differently and looking at different aspects of the trials, right? So I, I think I think there's gonna be an endless fascination on it forever and there will always be questions unanswered that people are trying to find the answer to. I hear you, yeah. It's tough with history sometimes. You just like, some stuff you can never know the answer to. Yep. Um, so, but here's something that we might know the answer to. <laughs> this is from an anonymous attendee who asks, how were the judges chosen for the trials? Ah. Yeah, good question. So actually all of the judges were members of the of the governor of the name to the governor's council. That is what we would call today our state senate. Hmm. In the new charter of 1691, there are about 22 of them, I believe it is. They were actually all picked by and signed in, into office by the king and queen. Um, wow. And then, but then from that group, Governor Phipps, when he arrives in May 1692 with the witch trials all underway, calls for this special court, a court of Oyer and Terminer. Uh, specifically designed to deal with the witch trials and, and the over 100 people by that point who were probably already locked up in jail. Um, so he chooses a panel of nine of these members from the governor's council, essentially today the state senate. It sounds odd to us, but back then, if you were a member of the senate, if you will, or the governor's council, you were also a local county judge. So these men had, had experience. Uh, it's, again, it's putting a little too much power in the... Oh, by the way, these men were also the militia officers. Oh, sure. So, no big. Yeah, of course. What could what could possibly go wrong, Jackie, right? <laughs> oh, God. Um, but so, um, the, it, it, these, so uh, Governor Phipps had to sort of choose a balance of, of these folks. He chose three of them from Salem, who were, uh, were already very much uh, in, in, in Essex County, who were already very much involved in the proceedings. Uh, actually, another one from three from Salem, uh, who had, many of them had been involved in the pretrial hearings. Uh, another one from from Haverhill, from Essex County, and then the other the, rest, the remaining judges came from Greater Boston area, including Judge Stoughton, and he picked Stoughton as as the to to really be the chief presiding justice because he was the deputy governor of the colony. So he really put his his right hand mm -hmm. man in, into that office. Um, so these these were men who had already, in theory, for the most part, had experience as 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 judges and were considered the, the top ranking officials. Because again, basically the governor's council back then, uh, again, not just for, for, formed as sort of our Senate would today, if you can imagine our Senate also being the Supreme Court of the colony, which it was. Yeah, yeah, different. And in fact, okay, so what is the name of this august body today? The Great and General Court of Massachusetts Bay is what we call our legislature to this day. But it started off really as a, uh, as, as a court more than a legislative oh. body. Ah, makes sense, doesn't it? It's all coming together. <laughs> the things you learn about through witchcraft. Amazing. Uh, next question up, um, also anonymous. 
Thank you for the presentation. I would like to know about any genealogy genealogies, wow, sorry everyone, <laughs> related to the accused um, that may have been published. There is a lot of genealogy that's been published on these families. Um, it's funny because many people only learn when they're middle-aged, actually like I did. I, I, I had always, as a kid, I knew and I had this weird ancestor, Dr. Roger Toothaker. And of course, as a 10-year-old, you're thinking like, wouldn't it be cool if he was a dentist, right? But yeah. <laughs> but then to make that connection to the Salem witch trials when you're doing the genealogy usually occurs later on in life. And what you find is many, many, many of these of these families of, 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 the, of, the, of the witch trials, uh, the victims have family genealogical and historical associations. Um, there's, a, there's, even, there's some group on, face, uh, on Facebook for, for descendants. Um, yeah, I would just, you know, you recommend you can, you can Google or take a look at Facebook. Contact the New England Historical Genealogical Society, who uh, has a lot of uh, research on a lot of New England, all New England families, including the witch trials. Um, for example, there's one uh, really very uh, well-known society for the town family. And you're saying, wait a second, Professor Baker, I don't remember anyone named town. Well, no, but that is the maiden name of the of the three town sisters, uh, Rebecca, Rebecca Nurse and, and her, her two sisters, all three whom were uh, accused, and, and, and in fact, two of whom uh, died. And the third one, Three Sovereigns for Sarah, the old PBS show, was written for Sarah Cloyce, the, uh, the third sister. So there's, there's a lot out there to, to look at. There's, uh, I think it, someone put into the chat the uh, University of Virginia Witch Trials website, which is a really good place to start for some basic information about the trials, including transcripts of all of the trials that I, I highly recommend. And, um, and then just start looking at family genealogies because there are a lot out there. That's awesome. That's such a great resource. Um, next question up, uh, this is from Christine Pierce, who asks, do you know anything about the role of Nathaniel Hawthorne's family in the Salem witch trials? Yeah, funny about that. Yes, um, Hawthorne's direct ancestor was witchcraft judge Colonel John Haythorne. Um, and he was one, again, one of the nine judges. He was uh, Judge Haythorne uh, and his somewhat partner in crime might say Judge Corwin, also from Salem, um, were the two kind of presiding judges in the pretrial hearings that took place really from March through May 1692, where someone would come in and swear on a complaint and they would go before Judge Haythorne and Corwin. They would uh, have the, the person arrested and they would bring them in for initial questioning. So Haythorne and Corwin were very, very much involved in the, in the trials, more so than, than, than other people. Uh, and and, and uh, played really a, a, maybe a, a but also I think it become sort of in history become like larger than life figures in the trials because they were just mm -hmm. two members of this panel of nine. And frankly, though, having said that, honestly, if you look at the judges and if you go to those all those documents on the Salem witch trials, it's almost impossible to tell the individual actions of individual judges. Mm -hmm. Once you get through some of these preliminary hearings where we know, for example, the judge Haythorne is doing the questioning. In most cases, they seem to act more as a group that pro probably are following the lead of, their, of the Chief Justice, Judge Stoughton. Um, but one of the things I'll point out that I, I found out is that basically, uh, what, half of these, more than half the judges were actually related by marriage. So they really were not just literally sort of part of the same group of leaders of the colony. They were literally relatives who very much think, thought alike. They're, they're the wealthiest merchants. They're members of the governor's council. They're leaders of the militia in the war effort that's failing. Um, and by the way, they've all, a lot of them have lost property in Maine, including the Haythorns and the Corwins in the, in the war that's going on. And they're looking for someone to blame for their problems. And I think sadly, then as now, it's a lot easier to look outward right. uh, and, and look for someone else to blame for your problems and to say, yes, well, maybe, it's, maybe it was the governor's pro government's problem. Oh, wait, that's us. What about the militia? Wait, that's us, right? Anyhow, yeah. So, but I say, you know, uh, I think, unfortunately, maybe the Hawthorne probably get too much notoriety because of Nathaniel. But having said that, Nathaniel understood this stuff all really well and took it very much to heart, as did, but did his other people in Salem as well. Interesting. Wow. Um, okay, so we talked a little bit about this earlier, but I think we could go into more detail. Okay. Um, Christina Asta Mayer asks, um, can we talk a little bit more about the relationship between puritanical views and witch hunts? Specifically, just more about puritanical views would be kind of interesting, I think. We have these images in our head of, like, so, the buckles. So first off, but... let's, let's kind of dispel them a little bit. And, and again, plug for one of my favorite places, Plymouth Plantation. If you want to see what daily life was like in the 17th century, and now technically the people in Plymouth were brownists, but 
they really wanted to separate from the Church of England. In some ways, they are more radical than even the, the Puritans of Massachusetts Bay, because the Puritans of Massachusetts Bay believe that the Church of England is corrupt, and but they aren't breaking from it. They just are coming over to New England to cre recreate it, okay? Hmm. In Plymouth, but my point is, if you go to Plymouth Plantation, where they've done an amazing job of recreating life in the, in the 1620s and 1630s, You'll see people dressed in brightly covered colored clothes. You'll you, you know you'll you'll see that you'll see them having furniture that's that's fancy and pretty and you know <laughs> you 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 could you could even ask them when they last had a pint of ale and they might say they had one the, the other night you know because um, because drinking is fine in moderation you know um, <laughs> yeah. and not in excess um, but so they live this kind of lives very much in balance uh, um, very much God is, is is a critically important element right. Um, but, but they aren't the kind of evil stereotypes dressed in black and white, never having fun or cracking a joke. But having said that, yeah, it's a pretty, it's, it's a pretty uh, severe form of, of Protestantism. Uh, basically, uh, everything is a sign of God's pleasure or displeasure. Um, and people in, in, in the 1690s are convinced that um, they have fallen from God's true path. Um, they, there's fewer people attending worship as they're supposed to on the Sabbath. Um, you know, there's more sort of people staying out late in the taverns and wealthy merchants showing off fancy stuff. And this is not the way to reflect the greater glory to God. And really, there's a sort of this crisis in the colony where pe people are they saying, like, we need to have moral reformation. We need to get back to the kids in school learning to read because you go to school to learn to read the Bible. Right. Um, and so I, and I think in many cases, this was that sort of Puritan crisis where in some degrees, Puritan Massachusetts was its own worst enemy because as the colony succeeded and became wealthy, people tended to stray a little bit from the pure devotion uh, to to God and, and to their faith. And of course, part of the problem is, right, to any, any Protestant at the time, God gives you a calling. And whatever that calling is, you must show your most devotion to God by working hard. So ironically, if God has chosen you to be a merchant, you want to work hard and be the most successful merchant you can be but guess what? That can lead to temptation, right? And, and the other thing I should say, too, is mm. Puritans felt more under threat from other religions because, believe it or not, about 10% of the population of Salem in 1692 were Quakers. Huh. And the Puritans perceived them as a horrible threat. It's hard for us to believe that, that uh, you know, Quakerism, Quakers. my God, what a lovely faith, right? Everybody's equal in the, before the eyes of God. No one's better than the other. I don't tip my hat to you because we're all equal, right? Thee and thou rather than sir or my lord. Um, but the pure women, women can get up and speak in church when the, when the mood hits them, as anybody can, right? Whenever God speaks to them. Yeah, exactly. Exactly. <laughs> that, that reaction was the perfect reaction of, of a God-fearing Puritan. What do you mean? It's the, it's the man up in the pulpit who, who's reading to us and telling us the word of God. Women don't need to do this. This is a patriarchal hierarchical society. Yeah. Mm -hmm. And again, it was seen by people to be in disarray in 1692. So there you go. And if I go on any longer, we'll get really dull and boring on the Puritans. We don't want to do that. We'll go too deep into Puritanism. <laughs> exactly. Yeah. Little bits at a time. So here's another question um, from an anonymous attendee. Thank you. Um, were the Salem events directly related to the witch trials that were happening in the 1500s in Scotland and England? Were they tied together at all? Yes. Um, again, in, in the sense that, um, well, we actually know that some of those learned treaties on witchcraft written uh, in England and Scotland in the late 16th, early to mid, and even late 17th century were owned by Salem Village Minister Samuel mm -hmm. Paris were owned by the judges. Um, they, the latest court cases to take place um, in, in England, we know were, were reflected here. You may, may recall actually in a fairly, I won't get political here, but in a very famous Supreme Court decision within the past year, they were actually quoting Chief Justice Matthew Hale of England. And uh, Hale had been involved in a very notorious witchcraft trial that involved the conviction of several people in, in, in a witchcraft case in in the 1660s um and so you know the officials in massachusetts were reading those court decisions were reading the cases were using the the the, the books and pamphlets written by hale and others uh and, and studying the, the trials and by the way looking at the kinds of evidence that was used and you see in some cases even in some of these trials you see clearly even the afflicted are reading this stuff too because some of the afflicted are acting very strangely in some way 
as the afflicted had in previous case in England, and even a strange case in, in Sweden, uh, where you had afflicted children in, I think, the 1670s, early 80s. Um, so all of this sort of feeds into what's going on in Massachusetts. Because remember, Puritans also, too, are amongst the most literate societies in the history of mankind. Um, in like around 1700, we think that the adult male literacy in Massachusetts was around 80%. Do you know what it is today? Less than that. Yeah. More like 70, 75, right? Yeah. Think about that. If you ever wonder about that rude person that, that, that is in the 10 item or less counter with 25 items, they may not know how to read. So mm -hmm. I, this is, you know, so this was a very literate society. People read the Bible, people had lots of books, and they knew exactly what was going on in England and elsewhere. Wow, that's wild. You don't think about the information being able to get across the pond that easily back then, but clearly. Also, to, and also letter writing. Every minister in every town, you know, oftentimes went to Harvard with the, the guy five towns over, and they were writing back and forth all the time. And, and in my, my book, The Devil of Great Island, I talk about this really bizarre type of witchcraft where you have stone throwing demons, literally throwing rocks at people. And, yeah, and it's true, or at least they were reporting it as true stories. But you can, you can chart the path of this where ministers are writing about it, and you can see a, a case that takes place actually where I am here in, in, in Great Island, Newcastle, New Hampshire. And within a month, there's a copycat incident 20 miles upriver. And within another month, there's a copycat case in New Haven, in, uh, in Hartford, Connecticut. And by the way, the minister in Portsmouth regularly corresponds with the minister where? In Hartford. There it Again, is. That'll do highly, it. This was, this was the information age. They didn't have the internet didn't have internet 1020 or 30, but they were constantly in touch with each other. Fascinating. I love it. Um, okay, next question. Joseph uh, Salvatore, Salvatore um, asks, can you explain the concept of spectral evidence and why it was allowed to be admissible as legal evidence in the trials? Thanks. Spectral evidence, I'm glad it, it came up because spectral evidence is the one thing that really kind of separates Salem and the high death rate from other cases of witchcraft. You heard me say before, there were normally two ways to convict someone of witchcraft. Right. Neither of those was spectral evidence. Spectral evidence was controversial stuff then as well as now. Spectral evidence is essentially someone being afflicted by someone else's specter. That is their spirit or ghost. Ow, 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 stop it, Jackie. You're all good. Right. This is what, <laughs> but, but people watching would be mystified because no one could see Jackie's specter and Jackie wasn't in the room, they only saw Dr. Baker there going like this. <laughs> and so again, to our, to our ideas, this is crazy. Um, and in the 17th century, it was considered crazy too, but for a different reason. Because in the 17th century, witches and the devil could create specters. Again, this is real stuff. But there was the big question was, who could create that specter and control it? And mm. some people, including the witchcraft judges said, so if someone's specter is harming someone, then that person's, person is in league with Satan. It's evidence they're a witch. Other people said, not so much. Satan is the great trickster. And it might be a twofer. Jackie might be a good person and is not hurting anybody, but it's someone else who she is, is, the, is, is the witch. And they are making Jackie's specter look like they're attacking somebody. And that's a twofer because you, you're strangling one guy and then you're getting Jackie accused of witchcraft. So that in essence is, and, and, and in 1692, the judges were very careful to ask the ministers about spectral evidence. And essentially the ministers write back several times, and, but they're too deferential. They're kind of going like, yeah, this is controversial stuff. Use it with great care. They really should say, don't rely on this. Yeah, like but stop. Instead, they're, they're being deferential to the judges. And it's like, you know, use it cautiously, sort of as an adjunct, right? Um, but you guys are on the right track. You're doing the right thing. Keep up the good work, rah, rah, right? And unfortunately, they took that advice far too seriously. And in almost everybody who was accused and convicted of witchcraft in Salem, the leading evidence they use is spectral. It's not supposed to be. They lead with it, and then they follow up with other things, you know, like, can we get a confession mm -hmm. as the secondary evidence? The truth, the, the, the truth is, in the, it's the results here. In the fall of 1692, after Governor Phipps stops the court of warrior and terminer, they still have over 100 people in jail. And they actually have to have a new set of, of trials starting in January 1693. They create a new court to do it. And it is actually today our Supreme Court. It's the, 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 then it's the Superior Court of Judicature. Now it's the Supreme Court of Judicature. But they cha Phipps changes the rules. He says, okay, carry on with the trials, 
But we, we all agree now that spectral evidence, improper things happen using spectral evidence. We are no longer using spectral evidence. And guess what? When you do that, no one, no one gets executed for witchcraft, right? And the only people who are convicted are a couple of people who confess. And then the governor says, yeah, no, we know you're just confessing to save your skin. So you're, you're, you're going free. So spectral evidence is, is rarely, rarely used. Uh, you don't see it very often. But to us, we, whenever we think of witch trials, we think of girls writhing and screaming on the floor, making right. it feel like someone's sticking pins into them or strangling them or what have you. But it is very much distinctive of Salem and also why, so, unfortunately, why so many people tragically lost their lives in Salem. Wow. Yeah. Fascinating very and stuff. spooky. Yeah. Yeah, it is. Yeah. It doesn't, um, doesn't take much, does it, you know? For someone to be scapegoated for, for uh, behaving the wrong way, you know, maybe someone who speaks with an accent or worships God a little bit differently. And all of a sudden, if you're looking someone to blame, bad things right happen. They're right there. Yeah. Yep. Well, unfortunately, we have to wrap up so we can do one more question. Um, <clears throat> this one comes out from an anonymous attendee again um, and asks, were the witches at one point declared innocent? Like after the fact? And if so, when did that happen? Right. Um, short answer to that is um, Governor Stoughton never was really unhappy the trials and it really wasn't happy that, that anyone was let go from prison. And unfortunately, he became after acting governor after, uh, in the wake of, of Governor Phipps's death. So oh. uh, th though there were efforts almost immediately from all the families to what we call restore innocency and technically not to get a pardon because a pardon means you've done something wrong. And technically what they sought was a reversal of a tainter, right? Mm. A, a really reversal of that verdict of guilty. Um, None of it could happen formally, even those efforts started as early as 1692 and 1693 until after Stoughton died in 1701. Um, the main pardons came in 1710, or excuse me, 1710, but and 1711. But um, it, people had to had to put their names forward of their of their family member who died or who had been wrongly convicted, and only a small number did. Um, so you actually have another wave of people who were pardoned in the 1950s. Wow. And like two, and then um, a, a bunch more in 2001. And then of course the last, what we, may, we consider to be the last person who was convicted of witchcraft in, in Salem in 1692, 93. Um, the, of course, just, uh, just in the end of the last legislative session, um, Elizabeth Johnson Jr. had her attainder reversed. So it has been a long process to restore innocency and to see that justice was served. And frankly, the last effort amongst the immediate victims, they were doing it over 50 years after 1692. Um, George Burroughs, the minister who was executed, his family was still in the 1740s petitioning the government on a regular basis for a, for a reversal of attainder and also um, to make up for the losses that the family has suffered. Again, not just financial, but reputation. They have this huge stain uh, you know, on them socially yeah. and religiously, right? So again, to me, that's one reason why I've got to write this next book is because it's going to be this it's been this incredibly long process of healing that, frankly, to those of us in Salem now, is still kind of ongoing to this day. But hopefully, at least we got that that last pardon out of the way. And people sort of say, like, well, come on, they, they pardoned her now. Did it really mean anything? And you know what? Many of these families, these organizations, these descendants, when these pardons take place, they know and they care a great deal. And it's very important to them, um, you know, even though they're 9, 10, 11 generations removed, um, because they've always felt that injustice. So uh, I'm, I was glad to see that finally happen. That's amazing I, that it took so long, but it's glad that it's, good that it's gone through. That's important yeah. stuff. Yeah. Wow. Well, thank you all so, so much for turning in this afternoon. Uh, we loved all your questions. I'm sorry we couldn't get to all of them. Um, and thank you so much, Dr. Baker, for this amazing conversation. Um, we hope you all had an amazing time. We can't wait to see you again for the next Ask the Expert event. Um, and goodbye. Have a great rest of your day. A great weekend.